Hello and welcome to Health Talk. I'm your host, Angela Baracco Eddy. And with me tonight, we have a panel, Dr. Roger Orth with the Endoscopy Center, the Sacred Heart Division of Gastroenter Gastroenterology Associates. We also have Steve Dunn, the Administrator at the Endoscopy Center or of Gastroenter Gastroenterology Associates. I'm gonna have trouble with that all night, I can tell. And we also have Michael Goldsbury. He is the Director of Health Information Technology um, with Gastroenterology Associates. And we're all gonna be talking about some fantastic topics tonight. We're gonna kinda keep it as a discussion for the beginning of the program and then we'll get your feedback in the second half of the show. We'll put the numbers up there and have you call in if you have anything you'd like to discuss. We're going to be talking about the Endoscopy Center, one of the centers of excellence, and we're also going to be talking about ICD-10, which is some medical coding, and there's a lot that we can discuss about that particular topic. So having introduced that, um, here's the panel. So everybody, welcome. It's good to see everybody here. Good to be here. Dr. Orth, I'm going to let you kick it off and get started with what you'd like to discuss first. And again, we have a lot of information this evening, so we'll uh, just go from there. Well, it, 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 it really started when somebody gave me my own copy. <laughs> my own copy of something that actually everyone hears about, but not everybody sees it. And I got my own copy of the ICD-10 code book. Show it sideways so they can see how And so the ICD-10 code book, I actually keep it in my kitchen and for parties <laughs> and things. <laughs> I have people come over and we, we thumb through it and we look up stuff. Why? Because it's so unbelievable that it becomes sort of a party favor. And why does anyone want to talk about this kind of party favor? Because it affects every single one of them. It affects every one of you. And as this has come up and it's hey, it's Dr. Orr's time for a show again. <laughs> I'm thinking, what should we talk about? I said, why shouldn't we talk about something that affected 18% of the gross domestic product of this country October the 1st? All of a sudden, on October the 1st, 18% of everything that had to do with the gross domestic product was changed when this system for paying everybody in the healthcare sector came in line. I thought it'd be interesting to hear a little bit about it. And because I'm not an expert on lots of th stuff like this, I also <laughs> brought my special specialist, Steve Dunn. He's a big dog now. He's in our group, but he's in fact running the group. And you know, he's just like Alice used to say, she's retired, that it's like herding cats. Working with doctors is herding cats, and so I'm one of the cats. And, and Steve's gonna keep us in modulation, but we're real proud of the work that they've done that brought us into the fore so that we have not had the success that some of the government intervention here is to driving towards, which is a single payer system. And right now we're still in not just private practice, we are in concierge medicine. We give a high quality, high level, high intensity contact because we know the patient, we look at the patient, we don't sit and stare at a computer as much while we're working with the patient, we don't type it in, but how did I do that? Mike. Mike's <laughs> over here. Mike is our chief geek. Now we actually have now a team of geeks. It's interesting. He's, Mike Goldsberry is so adept at this. And I keep, oh, I had to give him a raise again this year. Why? <laughs> <laughs> because they're all trying to hire him away for these companies. And actually, the more I look at the end, days of my practice, I want to be hired away for the company <laughs> because I'm going to take Mike with me and I'll be worth a lot of money. Because the whole thing comes down to how does this whole thing work? Now I was just going to mention that in 1984 when I came and joined Dr. Smith and Dr. Haynes, both of whom have retired now, but Dr. Smith just, we're missing him, but he'll come back some and Dr. Haynes <laughs> gives some guest appointments. But we had the three of us and then it turned out I made it busier, so we had to hire somebody who did something called billing and coding. That was Georgia. And we hired Georgia, and Georgia got Dawn. And so, and then Dr. Finelli, I got so busy right off, so Dr. Finelli came. So for, for a number of years, like seven or eight years, we had Georgia and Dawn and maybe one other person, and we ran four doctors. And we were busy, and we were delivering care, and we were enjoying that because we were doing what we're supposed to do in the Hippocratic Oath, which is 
really share with people's lives. And we do deal with life and death. And we deal with small things, but we deal with big things. But I didn't have to focus on the business part. Now, as time came along, there were other things, and we got bigger, and we now had different ancillary opportunities, and the micro-dissection of medicine is happening, so we're part of that. And gradually it grew up, and we merged in with our Baptist colleagues, Baptist Hospital, uh, GI doctors. We got bigger, and we became the endoscopy center, and we did things at the hospital also. And now, a lot of my work is really based at the endoscopy center. I still go to my Alabama clinics because I have so many friends there. Those friends are my patients. But I'm distressed at how this whole thing is evolving and how we're working, scrambling, to try and fill out forms instead of doctoring. I, I want to ask a quick question just to kind of lay some groundwork so everyone knows what exactly and specifically we're talking about. Who wants to define or explain in a little bit more detail what exactly is ICD-10? Well, that's why I've got Mike over here. There we go. <laughs> Mike is like a geek guy and he knows all those acronyms. Mm. And so you tell me about the alphanumeric system that has seven, nine digits or whatever coming up and what is that? Well, brief history, ICD-10 came about in, uh, in around 1900 as a means of um, charting and uh, documenting uh, morbidities. And it has uh, been updated every decade, um, or thereabouts, with some, uh, some delays and some, some bumps along the way, um, and was updated last in 1999, uh, which is ICD-10, which w is what we're here to talk about. Um, uh, and, and if you're doing the math, you're thinking ICD-10, 1999, that means that it is, it is over 10 years old. It is. Actually, they're working on ICD-11 right now, um, with it at least currently projected to be uh, uh, released uh, 2017. So next year you have uh, ICD-11 uh, to look forward to. Um, in, in a nutshell, it is a, it is a code set that represents um, diseases and uh, ailments and injuries um, uh, that, that have been documented by physicians uh, uh, across the world, um, is managed by the, the World Health Organization, and um, it is used everywhere in the world, however, uh, only here. Uh, as a as a means for billing and um, uh, uh, payment. So it turns out, how many codes are there again currently for outpatient management? Currently in ICD-10, uh, there are 68,000. Oh, 68,000. No. So the ICD-9 <laughs> had had how many? Uh, 14. 14, 14 but it had actually, over the prior eight or 10 years, it had scaled up from like 9,000, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Both so yeah. it was a fluid process. It was constantly changing because it was important as new things got invented because it was a billing process. ICD-9 was a billing process, and we lived by the law, and that's what it did. And somebody, wherever, believed us that we were taking care of someone. And we could validate it, and that was fine. ICD-10 is different. What, how is it different? Why do we have so many codes? Well, they've expanded the uh, specificity of the code set, uh, allowing you to drill down into the particular um, area of the body, the onset of the ailment, the, um, uh, the, the, um, the uh, tension, the, the, um, the, the strength of the uh, problem. Um, so it, it allows for a great deal of detail in the code set. Oh, um, what kind of detail? I mean, <laughs> how much detail could there be? Well, mm -hmm. let's, let's just take um, uh, mm -hmm. gastroesophageal reflux disease, which, okay. was, which was one single code um, uh, for, for um, ICD-9. You have uh, a number of... Uh, uh, contributory codes that, that have to go into a GERD. There, there are several codes for um, GERD now, um, and that's just one example. Actually, uh, it's interesting if you look at ICD-10, 
uh, six, you have really uh, six main um, digestive uh, diseases. Um, they had had some breakdown, but I mean it was six uh, digestive diseases. Um, fast forward to now, and you have many, many times that, um, and each of when, each, each of those have um, enormous amount of uh, specificity and uh, uh, required um, uh, contributing codes. Um, uh, H. pylori, uh, for example. Um, uh, you cannot code H. pylori without, um, without a, uh, a code that goes along with it, or um, you have to also pick up the phone and call the CDC because it, it is, a, um, it is a, 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 an outbreak of, of some, uh, of some uh, importance that the CDC wants to know about. Right. Uh, very uh, interesting. The, and the point, though, is that for our field, we can work in, and manage it. But if you realize that the 18% of the population of the entire economy also got juxtaposed with 60 now 75, 80,000 codes, but the codes have some pretty peculiar other things. And what's really strange to me is how it's all of a sudden it's the codes have not much to do with the billing process of how do you do something for someone and have a doctor patient relationship so that they actually help pay for you. That sometimes they, we used to have a code for giving me some chickens and I got jam for Christmas this year again. <laughs> and I get all kinds of little treats from people and the, when the growing season's happening and that's really not coded quite right. But the reality is now suddenly we have all of these codes and they're there for population dynamics. They're not there for, to run the healthcare system. They're there for population dynamic so that someone somewhere in a massive meta data base is accumulating enormous data on you, on me, but on you. It's on you being the patients. And it's affecting how your doctors can actually be still doctors. And I think it's, it's remarkable. How do you think things are going? Is it seems really smooth as we pick up on the ICD-10? <laughs> I mean, we are actually still open. It opened in yeah. October the 1st. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, we, we have spent an enormous amount of time trying to get up to speed on ICD-10. I'm, I'm, there are a lot of practices that are f much further behind the ball than we right. are, and I'm, I'm really worried about them. But uh, we, we have spent hundreds of hours, thousands and thousands of dollars training our billing office staff to be ICD-10 certified, uh, you know, just general staff training throughout the offices and through the endoscopy center uh, to be well versed in just what ICD-10 is uh, because it is such a the massive change. It's the biggest change I think in healthcare since uh, since Medicare itself. Uh, so it, it is, it is uh, we're, we're doing well. Could we do, be, be doing a lot better? Absolutely. Uh, there's, there's a, you know, we're, we're struggling to, to find the time to, to, to enter all the codes to, to go and say, well, did, did we get enough to the enough level of specificity? Is this as detailed as it needs to be? And let's go find, let's go find that out. Well, let, let me just ask you this because yeah. being just a doctor <laughs> uh, for all those years, I, I was able to find coworkers who were part of my team and they would spin out something off the procedure, say, well, somebody had a duodenal ulcer and a bleed, and I cauterized it, stopped the bleeding, everything got better. Who puts those codes in nowadays? Um, who has to be the person who identifies what the code is? Well, well, you're, we still have to get the information from that physician. From the, the which, how do, but, who but does the, the actual clicking? There's, there's, well, there's a group of, of 25 people that sit in their right. business office, and if we don't right. have it, we've got to go back but to the doctor. But my point is, it. is that yeah. we have 25 people who yeah. are handling these codes for the Absolutely. government. Absolutely. But in reality, the doctor it's, suddenly has to actually physically put that in there, right? Without a doubt. Uh, you're the only one that knows that information. And right. I want to talk about that in a lot more detail when we come back. But yeah. it is time for us to take our first break. So stick with us. We'll be right back with a lot more health talk. Your word is gastroenterologist. Can I have the definition? A physician who specializes in diseases of the digestive tract. Can you please use that in a sentence? When stomach pain persists... You should see a gastroenterologist. Could you tell me where I could find one? 
The Endoscopy Center on North Davis Highway has a highly trained staff of 12 gastroenterologists who are ready to serve all of your gastrointestinal needs. G-A-F. Your first date. Your first job interview. Your wedding day. Your first baby. The firsts of everything can be scary, but you survive. Your first endoscopy may increase your chances to survive. Colon cancer screenings can save your life. If you won't do it for yourself, do it for the ones who love you. The Endoscopy Center of Pensacola is an ambulatory care center designed with the patient in mind. Conveniently located on North Davis Highway, the center specializes in outpatient endoscopy. This is the direct visualization of the digestive tract with a video camera. Several different types of procedures are performed involving the esophagus, stomach, small intestines, rectum, and colon. All procedures are performed by board-certified gastroenterologists. Ask your doctor about the endoscopy center or call 474-8988. Hello and welcome back to Health Talk. I'm your host, Angela Eddy, and tonight we're talking about specifically ICD-10, which is a medical coding system, I guess, for lack of a better word, that was originally developed in 1999, implemented just this past October the 1st. So that's why there's still a lot of growing pains. Even though it's been out there for a while, it's not something that's been uh, mandated to use throughout the, the country until a little bit more recently. So we're talking about that. We're talking about the enormous amount of codes that there are. And just before the break, Dr. Orth was talking about how it's really up to the doctor. It's up to the physician to select which of these codes goes into the patient record or onto the patient's billing. So you have to be amazingly fluent in, what, 68,000 codes, something like that, to know. I mean, you probably don't use all of them on a you know regular <laughs> basis, but that's a lot of codes, even if it's only... 10,000 or 15,000, yeah. so that's really, a lot. There's really two issues with the code thing. All of a sudden, there's a lot of issues, by the way. <laughs> but all of a sudden, uh, we as physicians have to personally interface with the computer and look it all up for whatever we just did. And so it, a lot of times you're, when you're in a primary care doctor, you'll see he's actually looking up the codes while he's doing this. Now, I'm concerned about that approach because to actually pay the doctor for his time. He's looking it all up, and that's kind of interesting, except that everyone knows you're not supposed to text and drive. <laughs> How come you're supposed to text and drive in your healthcare visit when you, you have people who are incredibly well-trained for observation of the patient, but you want that doctor to text and drive while he's visiting with you? Does this not make you a little bit nervous? So I'm a little concerned about that part. And then there's a, a bigger part is that there's actually 80,000 or 75,000 of them because it has, the ICD system was designed originally to look for things to do with infectious diseases, really tuberculosis, malaria, that type of thing, because they were, and they would have it on zero down focus for those diseases. Because in the day, Louis Pasteur had designed this thing called the germ and we were all responding to the German. That was a completely different TV show I did on <laughs> Louis Pasteur. I really liked him. Um, but now, with the ICD, with having these characters, you can home in and, on what is in fact categories, and you have subcategories, you have severity, and you have this concept of laterality. Laterality is what's coming in October, when all of a sudden everything starts to get rejected next year. Why? Because we don't have laterality. And laterality is that you have 80,000 other codes that you actually now are being induced to. We're being told to find other codes. Now, I happen to know that you, you can get paid still if you just think of a code. But in very quick order, the best thing to do in the future, I used to think was to be a, a nurse practitioner or a nurse anesthetist because they could have nice jobs, be with fun doctors, and not have all the hassles the doctor has. But now I think the best thing is to be a coder because they got permanent jobs if this system keeps going. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And we can't even find coders. They're, they're added advertising. By the way, this is for all those young kids out there. Go be a coder, start your company, and you can have my whole deal. Uh, so it's, this whole thing of laterality is going to affect it, and that's why it's, well, there's so many codes. 
That's why what we really have is something that's up front. Up front, it's Edward Snowden watching everything you do because everything is out there and it can be shared. And it, it's, it's concerning me. Is there a danger, do you think, in a physician maybe saying, well, these are the ones, I, the top 10 codes I use most often, so we'll just use those and just let it slide? Well, it's, it, see, this has nothing to do with the actual care of the patient. It has to do with a, a billing process, but it's been juxtaposed on a process that's not there. But now, there's an incredible amount of stuff that's in your medical record that's now being submitted in large volumes. And there's healthcare risks, just like there isn't anything in the Geek Squad these days, because, gosh, I mean, even ISIS, or is it ISIL, I don't know, is hacking us and getting different things. Would you say it's a risk for the healthcare system? Oh, absolutely. Do we I mean, have any hits at Indo where somebody <laughs> would want our data? Why would they care of, if so and so had a pilot? Of course. I mean, a, a stolen credit card or a stolen identity oh, is worth, they is have worth that a few stuff dollars. In there. Yes. Uh, a, a health. Uh, a health record is worth fifty dollars, sixty dollars, seventy dollars. Uh, there's a huge target on all healthcare providers. I mean, you you <coughs> literally cannot go uh, three weeks without hearing about another breach. Um, we are uh, constantly fighting off um, uh, threats that are that are at our uh, gates and constantly patching holes that um, will will. Uh, they will, they will try to work around and we'll have to patch more. Uh, at any given time, we're getting hit by, um, by hosts overseas um, and, and have between you know, 20 and several hundred hosts uh, blacklisted. And basically that is a, that is a host that not only uh, wanted to look at us, but did some aggressive action against our uh, border uh, mechanisms. And, um, you know, th that's, that's at the, the gateway, and then, then when you get inside, there's another layer of security, and then there's more security behind, um, behind that layer. But um, it is a constant effort uh, to, to secure your network and, and to make certain that, that your patient's records are, are safe and secure and accurate. Um, because, you know, those, those records are, are used for you. Uh, to care for those patients, for your um, mid-levels, to care for, for your patients, and, and their, their accuracy is just as important as their privacy and security. Right. It's and that brings up a, a, another interesting topic, because are you the only one that does this in the office? No, no. no. I, I have a team. Yeah. Say so you have a team. There's a team of coders. There's a lot of people that are there at the office, Steve, that oh, yes. aren't doctors, that oh. aren't doing the actual Care of the care. patients. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, the, the the staff that that has has is now in support of the actual practitioners has has exploded. They're they're you know you, you hit any you look at the benchmarks of, of, of how many staff to to uh, to a provider and those numbers are, are are going up and they're going to continue to go up as as these kinds of things happen. I mean you don't uh, you. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we didn't have an IT department. Now we could not function without an IT department because the the, the direction that healthcare is heading, it just won't allow that to happen. And and you know, going back to what I said earlier as well, the smaller practices are are, are going to have that that challenge. How, how do they address those things? And we've talked to small practice, smaller practices in town about that. It says how they they're doing that. And I mean, there there's a big struggle out there for. For any healthcare pr practice, but especially the small practices, are having a ser serious challenge with it. So the switchover, because see, on October the first, eighteen percent of everyone in this country that had something to do with actually earning a dollar, all of a sudden had to go through this little cubbyhole, this little warren, and it's it's remarkable that mm -hmm. all those people have to do it, and they have to go through it suddenly. It and it for a Small practice, it's about two hundred thousand dollars, of t for them to do this transition, and for bigger practices, it might be in the millions of dollars, for this transition. And this is actually an uncompensated mandate, which, in its own special way, you c everything gets passed around to so and so, and so everything gets inflated. And actually, this becomes the ten dollar hammer working for the Pentagon. It's remarkable. 
the more you dissect it and think that there's a molecular level behind what makes the tissue work, it turns out there's an atomic level, and below that there's plasma levels. And every time they find another level, it costs you more money. It costs you more money, and, and you being the, the consumer. And, and you, you still need what we do. I, I mean, it is because it's fun, I'm still doing it. But yeah. it's getting more fun having little talks at my kitchen <laughs> table about this book. It, let's just have some fun for a minute here. Some of the codes that you get. <laughs> there are codes here for s sea snakes. Well, sea snakes I know because I, know, I did poisonous snakes at Tulane for inf when, and I did parasitology, so I know a little bit about this type of thing. But they are the most poisonous snakes in the world but they're endemic to, to Australia. We don't have sea snakes, sea snakes in America. And we have other things that pop up that are tangential. And actually, I'm going to not get too excited about it, because we also have things like bumping into a lamppost and getting hit by a turtle, since Dr. <laughs> Baracco is watching this right now. And he was telling Angela, oh, I, she already told me. I know. Paul. Sorry, Dad. Uh -huh. so, but she t he told me that he couldn't believe it. Ten years ago, some guy was working on making codes for injuries related to turtles. Mm -hmm. And that they were working on this for ten years. So somebody back before Obama was thinking of this, but only Obama and Obamacare has, a, has hijacked it. They hijacked the ICD-10 system and said, this is going to be the core central of how we control the money. This is going to be the core central of how we control the people. This is going to be how we control an industry so we can find it for somebody else because we're going to contract this industry. Europe does not use the ICD-10 for billing. Canada does not use it for billing, nor do they use it for any outpatients. So when we were told that this was the best thing going because we had to catch up, we're catching up with something, we're inventing it. None of those countries have this many codes. None of them. What other fun codes have you found? Well, they're struck by a turkey. Oh, uh, you, struck you by talked a about turkey. turtle. Yeah. I think uh, being struck by a turkey is is unusual. Uh, pecked by a chicken, which yes. is which could probably happen at probably the same time. Probably on the time. same page, ER. exactly the, book. the same yeah, visit. Sure. Yeah, a lot, of uh, <laughs> a lot of poultry related. Probably at a different time, struck by an orca. Um, that, is, that is a, yeah. a very interesting. That is really micro dissected. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you could you could be a pedestrian hit in a collision with a roller skater. Mm. I think that's, oh, that's you know. Oh, that's good. That's in there. Actually, your yeah. water skis to get on fire while catching, skiing. Yes, catching fire. Because actually, you know, in Cypress Gardens, a lot of them were trained right here on Bayou. Water Hard. skis. If they they would have fire. the flames, and if they have a fire that occurred while they were water skiing, so they made a code for it. And they made this into the system that we have to actually churn through so that they can study us, so they can figure out how to control us and contract us. This entire thing is designed to get rid of private practice, to move us down into a little boxes that they can control. And so it, get, it contracts from big, small groups into bigger groups and then makes the hospitals, oh, you wouldn't believe how much trouble the hospitals have with this one because they got a lot worse than the doctors. But, so the hospitals are having to scramble, and that's why the hospitals are swallowing the doctors, because they have to control the guy who's clicking the code. That's why they have hired so many doctors. They, can't, they have to control that guy, because they can't control their cost otherwise. It's time for us to take another break. Uh -oh. Again, there's so much to talk about with this. Stick with us. We'll be back with a lot more Health Talk. Your first date, your first job interview, your wedding day, your first baby. The firsts of everything can be scary, but you survive. Your first endoscopy may increase your chances to survive. Colon cancer screenings can save your life. If you won't do it for yourself, do it for the ones who love you. The Endoscopy Center of Pensacola is an ambulatory care center designed with the patient in mind. Conveniently located on North Davis Highway, the center specializes in outpatient endoscopy. This is the direct visualization of the digestive tract with a video camera. Several different types of procedures are performed involving the esophagus, stomach, small intestines, rectum, and colon. 
All procedures are performed by board-certified gastroenterologists. Ask your doctor about the Endoscopy Center or call 474-8988. Your word is polyp. Can I have the definition? A growth or tumor protruding from the mucous lining of an organ. Okay. Can you use it in a sentence? If you have a polyp, you should have it removed by a gastroenterologist. Could you tell me where I could find one? The Endoscopy Center on North Davis Highway has a highly trained staff of 12 gastroenterologists who are ready to serve all of your gastrointestinal needs. P-O-L. Hello and welcome back to Health Talk. I'm your host, Angela Eddy. And tonight with me is Dr. Roger Orth, Steve Dunn, and Michael Goldsbury. And we're talking about... ICD-10, the medical coding system that's being used these days throughout the country and actually throughout the world, but not for the same reasons. And we're also going to talk a little bit about the Endoscopy Center because the Endoscopy Center is a center of excellence. A center of excellence is a, a very high honor that not many places have. And Dr. Orth, I don't know if you want to talk about that or if you want me to pitch it to Steve, but one of you can kind of explain what that honor is and no, what Steve, it takes to... No, Steve, tell us, what is a center of excellence? Because they worked hard to get that designation. Yeah, what does it take to become one? Well, actually, there's multiple steps to, that you have to go through to get center of excellence. It's actually given uh, by the American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. Uh, not easy to say, and it's not easy to get. Um, <laughs> That it's their endoscopy unit recognition program. First off, you and the administrator and one of the physicians has to go to uh, specific training uh, related to becoming a center of excellence. And then on top of that, you have to do additional quality studies. Uh, the one that we you know, most frequently go to is our uh, adenomatous detection rate. Uh, and we can, we can get into that. I'm sure we've had many discussions about that as well. But um, uh, so you have to do additional quality studies. And then there's also additional mandates as to what quality measures you have to take uh, while providing care for your patients to be able to maintain that, that center of excellence standard. And you know, it's one of those things that it's, it's a behind the scenes thing that, that people really don't get to see, but it is, it is very important to the quality of care that they receive. Uh, one little thing I always like to point out is it's always just a, an interesting little fact is when, when you're cleaning scopes that's been that's been a big news in, in our world uh, as to you know how clean are these scopes one of the things that endoscopy unit recognition program recipients is center of excellent recipients uh, have is we're required to actually test the effectiveness of the, the chemical that we use to you do a high level disinfectant after before every single scope is processed to make sure that that that, that chemical is still potent the the actual standard that most facilities get to operate at is that it just gets tested every morning we do it before every single scope is processed so that that i can tell you that the scope that that you've got it, it went through this cycle the cycle was complete and that that chemical was potent so it, it, it is it's a it's a much more expensive process for us but it's something that we think we should offer to the patient. It gives, you know, it's a much better environment, in our opinion, for them uh, to, to get to experience the care. So, uh, from the standpoint of expensive, yeah. since you brought yeah. that up, sure. I, this is, it's important from my point of view that we <clears throat> actually are delivering something quality to people yeah. and that they're happy about that because this is what I do. Um, and my little directional drilling kind of work at the endoscopy <laughs> center. But from the standpoint of expensive, how does this compare to like the hospital structures? Well, the the is, from a cost standpoint. Well, you know, for for things like this, um, that that is that's normally included in in the reimbursement just in general uh, for for both us and the hospital. But one of the big differences in hospital reimbursement is that uh, when they come in for a procedure, if there's a high dollar disposable, uh, they frequently get to bill for that disposable at the endoscopy center. That is just included in the cost of the procedure. So uh, um, there are some needles that we use at the endoscopy center that it can be as high as two or three hundred dollars, and that that we just have to absorb. Um, you know, uh, balloons are twenty-five dollars each. Uh, um, these raw well, for the global that we cost use, of it's, the whole it, procedure. It's, it's it's in there. I, the global I, yeah. cost of the yeah. procedure. I'll just tell you, if you were going to spend three thousand dollars at the endoscopy center for say a colonoscopy. That same one at the hospitals are anywhere from ten to fifteen thousand for the exact same procedure. The doctor himself gets not a dollar more or less at either place. 
but the, the facility gets that much. And now the facility, we're actually obviously running a very low cost facility because actually the, the, the ECFA, the, the CMS is, is changing the rules for the hospitals because they're making it so it's incredibly difficult to get approval to do any cases at the hospital because it costs the, the, the Medicare or the insurance companies too much. But we're really proud of the fact that we have a high quality system. We got you making things clean and you making things safe and we're happy about doing it. It's, it's entertaining, but I wanna make sure that we can keep doing something because if I retire, my wife will go nuts if I'm there all the time. <laughs> and thinking of things that she could do, and the next thing you know, oh my God, can't you just get a part-time job? <laughs> and I'm getting older, I'll be 65 this year. And it's just amazing how much fun it's been, but I wanna keep fun. In fact, it, it's also interesting to see how many friends we make. Can, can you show us that graphic, by the way? We have a graphic, and this graphic uh, shows you yes. where our patients come from. Our patients don't just come from 20 and 40 miles away. This is, this is the endoscopy center updated graphic over the course of the last number of years. And the density of the patients is not reflected in that. It's just where they're coming from. I see we finally have Montana covered. <laughs> and by the way, I got emails this week from Saudi Arabia and from Dubai. We get patients who are living down part-time in Panama. We're way out of the country also. But the point is, is that this is what makes it entertaining. We're opening a project that's not just a local product. And we make friends and they come back for their half year, their half years and they're spending three months here and three months someplace. And I get to find out where, who's coming in for whatever. This is really inter interesting. You meet some really interesting people. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I think one of the big draws is being a center of excellence. How, how many centers of excellence are there in this area? In this area, just us. Um, there are only 17, at last time I checked, in the state of Florida. There's us, there's Jacksonville, and then you go down to Orlando or uh, in South Florida before you find the others. How about in Alabama? Um, I, I don't know how many there are in Alabama. It, it's, it's really interesting. It t since, tends to be... There are none in very, the lower half of Alabama. It seems to be very, yeah. very heavy in certain states, that, that, that more states, that there will be a high concentration in a single state and then a very low concentration in others. And I think that's one of the yeah. reasons that on that graphic you could see yeah. such a, a large density, it seemed like from you know, east to west. I mean, mm. really it's centrally located, but people are coming to the endoscopy center because of, of that center of excellence designation. It means a lot. I think it does. I, I mean, it also, I think speaks to the quality of the physician uh, that we that we have working with the endoscopy center. That that these doctors, you know, their their reputation precedes them, and they bring, uh, you know, additional you know um, um, emphasis to the endoscopy center by working f with with the center. So it's uh, you know it's it's nice to have that group of physicians providing those services, you know, at, at, at a center of excellence. It is a really good harmony for for Pensacola. Right. So we have hit a lot of uh, different things tonight and in this last part we'll probably take a few phone calls, see if anybody else cares about this. I think <laughs> you can see we're a little bit on the impassioned side. <laughs> but uh, I just am struck by how this entire process is actually trying to design us to get out of the business. And it's trying to improve quality levels, that's true. But they're using a lot of verbiage to study you as a population. And, and I hear all this talk from the different candidates for this and that, but I really don't hear anyone talking about what is in fact something that affects every one of you. And, and it just this week my wife told me that her rheumatologist no longer takes any Medicare patients. And I happen to know that my loving ex-wife, who's a rheumatologist, couldn't keep up with this and she's now working for one of the big hospitals. Why? Because they're smaller groups. They, they're, they're changing. And I think it's, this, is a, this is the kind of issue that we should be talking about, not whether so-and-so likes such and such group coming into the country. This is, this is affecting all of us every day. It's just a big deal. And, and I'm glad to still be part of it as a one of the group. And we were talking about some of the changes that are coming up 
this year, so just after having been implemented for one year, this October, some of the stuff that you've kind of been able to let slide as far as the billing goes isn't going to be okay anymore, right? Because they were kind of letting everybody get used to the system and learn it a little bit and start getting used to some of the codes. But if you have a code, for example, we talked about GERD, if you were coding it just as GERD before, that might have been okay and it might have still been able to slip through. But that's not going to be okay anymore starting in October, is it? No. Um, starting in October, you will have to have a specific uh, code for, for whatever the ailment is. And, and uh, you know, we're, we are focused on that specificity right now. We, we're certainly aware that, that some folks to get by um, have been focused on on getting a code onto the the claim and getting it out of the um, out of the door. Um, that's not going to cut it come October first, and and we don't expect a delay on it as there was a delay on uh, ICD-10 implementation several times. Um, they have all but uh, assured us that October first comes and they will grade us on specificity, and we will have to issue refunds. Um, when, when claims are denied or, or when claims are audited um, more, more accurately. Um, and, you know, GERD is, is a, a code that we've grown to know and get comfortable with, and now it's GERD with or without uh, dysphagia, I think, are the, are the two uh, particular ones there. And then there's, like I said, the, um, the comorbidities that, that affect that ailment. And really it comes down to um, capturing uh, come October 1st again um, it is a it is a, um, uh, a, a free for all um, grab of as many codes as you can put on a claim um, with the goal being to code every single ailment um, that is affecting that patient during that visit uh, that encounter um, so hypertension which gastroenterology does not treat uh, needs to be on the claim uh, if it is affecting their um, their their disease or their condition um, and any others you know that's just one example. So if they're on medication treating their hypertension that might affect medications that they might receive for whatever they're coming to see you for that might be something that has to be noted in there and coded appropriately? Yeah, I, I think it gets back to what Dr. Orth was saying, that, that Medicare, uh, who's the driver of this, CMS, um, but, but really all of the insurance companies, they want to see a complete picture of that, of that patient um, at any given time. They don't want, they don't want gaps in, um, in their, their record uh, with the insurance company. The insurance company wants um, to, to implement, so does CMS. CMS is really the big driver on this, um, population health care. Um, and, and manage uh, chronic conditions more effectively, at least in their, um, in their way of addressing that. Well, let, let me just mention that, as you say, I'm going to manage it more effectively. Are they managing the patient or are they managing the expense? Because one way they do use the ICD-10 system in Europe is to limit care. Mm -hmm. So for specific diagnosis, if you have a certain diagnosis, and the resources are limited in the system, which by definition, perforce, we have limited de resources. The patient no longer gets a choice whether they can have that treatment. That's what this is for. This oh. is a population dynamic, not because we're talking about heartburn here, kids. We're talking about whether you can go to the doctor for such and such a problem because you're already too sick, that you've got too many other things, and that the doctors got paid to list all the other things you have. And then all of your record is out there. And in the Hippocratic Oath, we're supposed to keep things confidential here. Read the Hippocratic Oath. I reread it this morning. It's been a while since I had to say it. And it, it does say that, that we're supposed to have things confidential. Now suddenly, a bunch of strangers have it. And we have, hold on a second, and we have people who are doing things. The government has a group of people called the Navigators who are going to help you get into Obamacare, but they have access to your record, and they have nobody knows who they are. Now, if I was an infiltrator, I'd become myself a navigator, and I'd get in there, and I'd get your record, because I can get sell it in Romania for God knows what. Who, who <laughs> wants to buy this? But they want it. That's your identity, buddy. There's a huge black market for uh, right. medical records. Right. We're, uh, and, it's, just, and, uh, it's your identity. 
and they want your identity out there so they can study you. This bothers me. Still a lot more to talk about. It's time for we'll us to take, take one calls. more break. We'll take your calls when we get back. If you have questions about this, please come back and we'll get you on the air when we come back with more Health Talk. The Endoscopy Center of Pensacola is an ambulatory care center designed with the patient in mind. Conveniently located on North Davis Highway, the center specializes in outpatient endoscopy. This is the direct visualization of the digestive tract with a video camera. Several different types of procedures are performed involving the esophagus, stomach, small intestines, rectum, and colon. All procedures are performed by board-certified gastroenterologists. Ask your doctor about the endoscopy center or call 474-8988. Your word is endoscopy. Can I have the definition, please? Endoscopy, a visual examination of the interior organs by use of an endoscope. Can you use that in a sentence? An endoscopy is a life-saving procedure that can detect the early signs of colon cancer. Well, can you tell me where to get one done? The Endoscopy Center on North Davis Highway has a highly trained staff of 12 gastroenterologists who are ready to serve all of your gastrointestinal needs. E N. Your first date. Your first job interview. Your wedding day. Your first baby. The firsts of everything can be scary, but you survive. Your first endoscopy may increase your chances to survive. Colon cancer screenings can save your life. If you won't do it for yourself, do it for the ones who love you. Hello and welcome back to Health Talk. I'm your host, Angela Eddy. There's a lot of discussion going on about ICD-10 <laughs> and the coding system that that uh, is entailing, I guess, the whole system itself, what it means, what it means to you, what it means to the physicians, to the health care centers, the hospitals, different things like that. And there's just a lot of discussion. If you have anything that you'd like to either ask or if you would uh, like to make a comment about that, feel free to give us a call. The numbers will be on the screen for the last part of the program, 432-7768 or if you're outside of the Pensacola area, 1-800-950-2522. Again, it's going in an interesting direction, and it's a different direction than um, most of the world. So, Steve, during the break, we were talking a little bit about that. I don't know if you want to bring that up or if you want Dr. Orth to. No, I but... want Steve to because he's, uh, he's quality management over there. <laughs> All right. So, well, one of the things that we were talking about, kind of what we had, we had left off with was, was these ICD-10 codes. And how many you know patient? How much how much information they put we put on that patient record? And one of the one of the things that these that these carriers are looking for beyond just Medicare, or other carriers are looking for, is the more information that we put on, the more ICD-10 codes that we include, the more we can say our patient population is is more ill than than this physician patient population over here. And so, if all things are equal, we both cost the same. But I've got a sicker patient population. Well, clearly, I'm a I'm a more effective, more efficient doctor. And and so then they take you know they take Doctor A, who's who's that more effective, more efficient doctor, and they say, okay, well, we're going to put you you're, we're going to put you in tier one. And then that that uh, Doctor B, who is who is less effective, you know, less efficient, you know, we're going to put him in tier two. And and tier one, we're going to pay a little more. Of your copay or your co-insurance or the, your the patients out of pocket, the, so they're going to try to steer those patients to the the least costly physician, and and there there are quality metrics in there as well. But but you know when you're when you're looking at a a something that steers patients that way, it, it, to me it gets really close to the the carriers practicing medicine and. And, and it makes me, I, I'm uncomfortable with it, and I've been uncomfortable with it for, for quite a while. And especially if it's based yeah. mostly on how many of those codes are there, and not right. necessarily yeah. what well, it, they it ends are. up driving the system. You get what you paid for, and the VA doesn't cost you anything. And this, has, this, this is really troublesome to me, how they deal with the veterans. Yeah. This drives me nuts to see the, pa the patients from the veteran services mm -hmm. come over to see us because they're having trouble. And this has nothing to do with the doctors, but the, the doctors are so contracted in their ability to deliver the care that they can't really do the stuff because they're their own typists, they do their own scheduling, they do their own stuff, and they do their own callbacks, and that's what they're doing. And that's, this is not going to be the way the average American wants to be treated. In fact, 
when the VA doesn't do it, we're happy to do it for them. And I'm proud to take care of the VA guys coming all the way from Montgomery. But, but that doesn't mean that that's really a good way to do it. And is this really the way you want to save the dollars? Uh, and honestly, whether or not I can click the most comorbidities does not mean I'm a better doctor. Yeah. I'll tell you what's a better doctor. It's a guy who's good at it. Mm -hmm. And you will know that because you talk to so-and-so who was your friend or your cousin or your great Al Sally and they show up from wherever because you made their aunt better. And, and it's not because you could click out click somebody. And that's a really important point. Being a real doctor means you're really taking care of the patient, not looking at that computer. You use the computer at other time slots, but you're looking at that patient. Absolutely. Think about it. Absolutely. This is an issue for really a much bigger people than us. But I wanted to make sure you got a chance to think about it. We got a call come in, so I want to try and get you on the air. Thank you for calling. Do you have a question or a comment? Hello, are you there? All aware. I think we're all aware of the uh, rising cost of health care. And my question is really, um, you know, is this a cost containment initiative? And if it is, how effective has it been? It sounds like with all the additional staff, it's, it's driving up the cost. And, and then I just wanted to uh, see if this is kind of part of the broad-based Affordable Care Act, and, you know, if it is, um, is it something that can be um, legislated out? I don't think it can get legislated out, frankly, but this is clearly a cost Thank containment you. maneuver. Uh, and so by, by pitting the different parts against each other and then trying to control the parts and then trying to make it smaller, I actually think the entire thing was designed to fail. It was designed to fail so that it could come forward with its own single-party, single-payer system, the VA, etc. But look at this. The first group of people to have a big group that actually had uh, a EMR system, an electronic medical record, it was the VA. It was the VA. And they were the biggest HMO in this country. And I've outlived other HMOs, by the way, and I'm going to outlive this one. <laughs> but the VA cannot even get it together with the DOD, the Department of Defense, so that their own EMR systems can merge. Well, how are they going to tell us to run our store? and micromanage it. Yes, this is going to drive up the cost, and when it drives up the cost, it's going to drive out the doctors, making it so that you have access to health care limitation. When you have access problems, it will spend less money because there aren't as many people doing it. And you cannot import enough doctors to redo this, and that's why we have all these para-providers now. Nurse practitioners, PAs, etc. And does it make me a better doctor? Well, it makes me busy, but I kind of miss seeing it in the clinic. And, and I really don't think the whole thing is just shifting in, in a monumental fashion to force you. To, and they think this is going to save the money. But the way it's going to save the money is by only by restricting the number of people doing it. Now, this is not something that they just can hand you a book and say, here's your codes, go for it. I got it right it. here. Yeah, but I got a book. <laughs> there's some training that has to go along with this. There's some stuff you've got to learn. And I know if you're an existing physician, you probably didn't learn about this in medical school going through. <laughs> so you've had to pick up on this and learn as, it, as it's being well, implemented and learning. But for the new doctors coming in, is this something that they're spending time having to learn and go through? and not spending some time doing actual medical training. Well, I think the average doctor these days wants to go work for somebody else who's going to do this stuff. And that's exactly why the, the the, you need a vertical integrated system to really run the system, which is for right now they're going to have these large health operations like Baptist or Sacred going all the way up and having all the different levels. But eventually they're going to have to truncate those levels too. And because those hospitals are being squeezed so hard, it, it, is, it is so unfortunate to see how it's squeezing it because it changes how we can deliver the care even inside the hospital. Because they don't have, they have a lot of people do the coding, but they don't have what they used to have for us to do the work 24 7, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And yes, I'll take out that piece of meat, I'll be there in a half hour. <laughs> and that's a problem. I want to be able to go back to the day where I could be there whenever, because the only one I was spending money on, I was spending my time. And time is money, but I made enough money. 
Now I got all these employees, I don't make any more money. And the, the whole thing is ridiculous. And that's the thing, the doctors aren't necessarily getting rich off of this. this no, is, no, the doctors aren't making so any money out of it. There's so other teams This entire that are thing is contracting. Work. It's contracting the number of doctors and that's how well, they're going to save the money. There's there's pressure on every side, you know, mm -hmm. for 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 the practices. I mean, you, you you're you're mandated. CMS doesn't negotiate what they're paying. They 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 dictate. This is what we will pay for a procedure, regardless of of anything else. And so you know, so you have these mandates being handed down from from government agencies saying you're going to click this box. You're going to use this. You're going to do that. And, and meanwhile, the the revenue is 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 going down, but you're seeing an increase in the in the in the mandates of what you will deliver as far as care. So you're you're, you're getting pressure on both sides inside the inside the medical community, where you know that declining per case revenue and the increasing per case cost. It's 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 a it's a really tight tightrope to walk. It's very narrow. Mm -hmm. We just have a little bit of time left. I want to go back to some of the funny codes that we've found. Michael, could you tell us a few more? Again, we're kind of having to wrap up here, but it's a good thing to... Uh, I, think we, I think we touched on one of them before. I mean, there is an unspecified spacecraft accident uh, injuring occupant. So, I mean, there, there, are, well, uh, there are several folks... So. I did want to mention that there's a series of codes for nuclear weapon explosions, whether radiation or blast. And I want to know who's going to be doing the coding <laughs> when that, that happens. Thank you all so much for joining us. We've had a great <coughs> time. You. We'll see you next time you. with more Health Talk.